everyone, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and today we are going to try to create a speckled non-superwash yarn using acid dyes mixed with citric acid powder. I am actually going to use some of the same dyes that I did when I attempted to do this using spice jars, low immersion, a few months ago. But the difference here today is that I will be using a countertop technique and my fingertips to apply the dye to the yarn so that way we have the chance of ending up with more discrete speckles versus a very lovely, variegated, more splotched colorway that we ended up with last time. Before I talk about the speckling project any further, I wanna give a huge shout out and thank you to today's lab partner, Lisa. Lisa, thank you so much for being my lab partner today. I already have some dyes mixed with citric acid and we will be using the pink orchid we used in the other video. And I also have some Dharma True Black mixed with citric acid from I think a Chemnitz Dialogue recap video where I added on some speckling. I typically do not measure out the amount of acid dye I add to citric acid for speckling. Uh, I will usually measure out the amount of citric acid and then take like a heaping like edge of a spoon or something of the acid dye to mix that up together. In general, when I'm mixing this up, I aim to have more citric acid powder than the acid dye that I am adding. So that way it really does dilute the dye powder, which will allow us to spread it out more on the surface of the yarn versus if we were taking, say, a pinch of the straight dye powder, uh, then as it falls onto the yarn, it would be in like bigger clumps with more dye and so they would spread a little bit more. For the yarn, today we will dye a couple skeins of Knit Picks Wool of the Andes Worsted Weight Yarn. This yarn is 100% Peruvian Highland wool, and if you'd like to learn more about it, I will have a Knit Picks affiliate link down in the video description. I am pre-soaking the yarn in some plain tap water for at least 30 minutes. Since we will be doing a countertop technique, I will eventually add some acid with this yarn so that way the dyes can strike. Even though we do have citric acid mixed in with the dyes already, I do want to add acid to the yarn as well so we can try to get sharp speckles. But since I'm soaking yarn for a couple different projects, I didn't want to add acid to this first batch. Now I want to transfer the yarn we're going to speckle into some water with white vinegar. And this basin is maybe half full, and I think I'm going to go ahead and let's add four tablespoons of white vinegar to it. Uh, I'm hoping that we will be able to keep the speckles fairly small. And let's go ahead and do this with 200 grams of yarn. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do 200 or 300 grams of yarn before we started, but let's do two. And now we can get up, set up to start speckling. Now that the yarn is in the water with vinegar, it doesn't need to soak there very long. Uh, so I will get everything else set up and then we can remove the yarn, add it on the countertop and start speckling. Since we are gonna be using dry dye powders today, I am going to put on my deluxe rubber respirator mask, safety glasses and gloves whenever I am dealing with the dry powders. So I will be sounding a little bit more muffled in a moment. I've already mentioned that the dyes we are gonna to use today are True Black and Pink Orchid. And so I just wanted to show two different ways that I store the dyes, sometimes in these takeout containers, or if I've been using the spice jars already, I will store the dye in here. However, since I'm gonna be speckling with my gloved fingertips, I am gonna transfer color from this jar into this container, so that way I can easily reach in, pinch the dye to then speckle onto the yarn. I've arranged the 200 grams of yarn on the counter, but I now want to spread it out. Uh, so that way we not only have the top layer of yarn exposed, but as we speckle, we can get some more uh, yarn from some of the under layers here as well. But since this is a worsted weight yarn, it'll be a little bit easier to get good coverage just because there are fewer strands overall. I squeezed out most of the water from the yarn so that way it is not very saturated, which should help things be uh, nice and small. Let's start with the pink orchid. And I'm taking just a pinch and like you might add salt onto something, I am sprinkling little bits of the dye. And the nice thing is that this color is dark enough that I can see the little specks. 
which I will zoom you in in a moment because I know that you probably cannot see. But unlike the heavy speckles where the color spread and sort of blended together, this is gonna give us an opportunity as I transition to the black to have some smaller, potentially more discrete speckles. But I could go even lighter than I'm going now. But we're just doing sort of a first layer to see how this will work. But I am seeing, okay, the colors are, some of those first colors I added are now starting to sink in a little bit. It took some time. Oh, but I guess maybe you can see the black a little bit better. Let me zoom you in. The pink as it's soaking in is pretty subtle. I can see the little pecks of, of color and because they're spreading a little bit, I feel like it's gonna be a little bit pastel, which isn't a bad thing. The black is also spreading out a bit. In some areas you can see the specks feel a lot more gray because that dye is sort of sinking in and spreading out a little bit. And so it's getting a little bit diluted onto the yarn itself. But we may have some spots where the color is a little bit more intense as well. But I have a feeling that as all this soaks in, that it will end up feeling a little bit more gray. On a superwash yarn, the speckles on the countertop like this would soak in, but not necessarily spread out as far because even without heat, they might start to strike to the yarn. And so that is also just something to keep in mind as you're playing around with this kind of technique. But now I think I'm gonna wait five minutes just to give the dye time to soak in from where we have it here. And then we will flip the yarn to start adding color to the other side. In those five minutes, some of the dye has spread out, but I'm still seeing speckles, little pops of color. So it's working. Now, as I flip the yarn, I don't want to rub it too much on the countertop because I know that the colors are going to spread some, but I don't want to make them spread. I would like the speckles to stay sort of put where they are. So instead of rubbing or pressing too much, I'm sort of just lifting and moving the yarn. But now I'm going to go ahead and apply dye to the other side. Using a small pinch of powder in my gloved fingertips, I applied dye to the other side. I didn't bother to wash my gloves in between the pink and the black because I knew that I wouldn't be introducing too much of the color into these containers. And these aren't the dye stock containers. So therefore, if I do get some contamination between the two, it's not that big a deal. But I wouldn't be forever adding a little bit of black into my pink orchid dye tub shifting the way that color works. This time I didn't wait between applying the dye and then moving the yarn to apply more color to other sections. You are more than welcome to wait in between to allow those colors to sink in a little bit and that way you don't um, maybe move the powder as you move the yarn. I am satisfied with the amount of color I have added here and so now I want to go put this into a steamer basket to steam set the yarn for at least 30 minutes but I did observe that in some of these areas, the colors have spread a lot more. So the speckles are more like a big splotch. It almost looks more like I took a, da a dropper and used like a drop of color onto the yarn versus having some sharp speckles. So I'm gonna go and put this in the steamer basket right now. I'm gonna clean up the counter and then I'll show you what the steamer basket setup looks like but I have showed that in other videos. This is my steamer basket and yeah, even now I'm seeing a lot of spread on the colors. It's only been a few minutes. I'm sure we might have some subtle small speckles like I see a little bit right there, but I think that mostly our colors have spread out and sort of wicked through the yarn a little bit, which is giving us some really lovely pastels. And when it knits up, it'll feel a little bit speckled, but we may need to rethink our technique if we want to get sharper speckles and say, try uh, low immersion, but having the dye mixed with citric acid and applying it in really small areas. It's been 30 minutes and yes, I am seeing Okay, I see some tiny speckles in some of the pink. Okay, 
I think that getting it into the heat fast is key to not give thing, things time to spread out more. There are some tiny specks, um, but we will take a closer look at this later on. I'm gonna set this aside to cool so we can wash it. There are some tiny speckles on here. You know, there are some things I would consider to be speckled, but a lot of the color, I could see some depth and difference in there. A lot of the color did spread though. Yeah, so I guess as I've said probably a few times now, I think we will need to try this again, low immersion, using dye with citric acid powder, but with my fingertips. And potentially, trying pretty low water as well. Because the more water, the more the colors spread before they strike. But I'm not expecting to see any color bleeding here. We do not have very much color at all on our yarn. So I'm just gonna add a tiny bit of some dish soap. Just to see. Uh, but you know, it's possible if I was dealing with a non-superwash yarn that had higher twist to it, that this would be a tad bit easier. But since Wool of the Andes is fairly lofty overall, um, that allows things to just spread more. Another option would be to, as um, after you add the dye, to steam set it in each stage before letting those colors spread. Or really, I mean, trying to do this in the steamer basket. Uh, who knows? There are many things that you could absolutely consider, um, but I still think that this will knit up in a very nice speckly way. And we'll take a closer look once it is dry. So I'm gonna finish rinsing out that little bit of soap, and then I'm gonna put the yarn through my spin dryer, hang it up to dry so we can come back and have some conclusions. Here is our attempt at creating speckles on non-superwash yarn using dyes that were mixed with citric acid powder. And you, when we're far back, you see the larger splotches where the colors spread out. And the black speckles definitely do not look black. It looks a lot more gray because those colors did spread through the fiber a bit and they did not strike super fast, were not super, super sharp. Uh, maybe one way around this would be to use dye that was not mixed with citric acid. So maybe it wouldn't strike as fast, but it would be more concentrated where you've put it. Um, another option would be to use more dye to citric acid in that ratio. And I do get some questions about the ratio I used. And again, it's something that is fairly random and by feel. So maybe if I were to replicate this again, even though I have more of this dye, these exact same colors mixed up. And so I do want to try that low immersion. So even though I have that existing, I should try it with colors that I am mixing up a little bit more fresh. So that way we have a little bit more information about that ratio and proportion. Now when we zoom in, there are speckles. We do have discrete little specks. And in some cases, more pastel blown out specks, both in the gray, but also in the pink. It's just fairly pastel. There are also some areas where the colors pop a little bit more. And I wonder if those are some of the ones that we added more right before we put it in the steamer basket. And so I think that we could have better success with low immersion. And that's why I'm intending to try with these exact same colors. So that way it's the same dye molecules, the same pigments. And even if we add a different amount of it, it's the same proportion of pigment to vinegar. We can see if we get something that feels sharper from what we have here. Now, evaluation of the technique aside, I think that this yarn is fun, it's pretty, it would pair really well with a more saturated color. And when knit up, I think it would give a mottled, speckly feel because a lot of these patches of color are small enough that they're only going to be present over a few stitches. They are randomly placed so they shouldn't pool, and I think it would give a very fun fabric, whether you're knitting or crocheting or even weaving with it. Side note, when I'm talking in these videos, often I might say knit up, but I definitely don't want to discount the crocheters and weavers that watch. And there are a lot of other fiber crafts 
as well and things people use yarn for. And so I personally knit more than I do any of the other crafts, even though I am weaving more lately. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that uh, sometimes I might use knit as a catch-all for how the yarn might work up into something finished, but certainly the yarn that I dye would work well for all of these other crafts. Lisa, thank you so much for being my lab partner for today's episode of Dye Pot Weekly. I really hope that you enjoy your non superwash speckled yarn. Sure, the speckles aren't nearly as fine as what we might see on superwash yarn, but uh, when you knit it up, there will still be like a modeling in it that'll have a speckled appearance. And so in that respect, this worked really, really well. So Lisa, thank you again. Ooh, another thought just popped into my head. I don't know if I have any skeins of Wool of the Andes Superwash in my stash, but certainly this is calling for a side-by-side -side comparison of Superwash and non-Superwash yarn when you're dealing with the same base and same kind of twist. Uh, comparing Wool of the Andes, which is 100% Peruvian Highland wool, to Swish, which is 100% Superwash Merino, isn't the fairest comparison because the twist and the type of wool are different versus just having been treated to be superwash versus untreated. Although I shouldn't call the fiber untreated because it's probably been bleached in some kind of capacity to have the berry yarn color. Uh, so anyway, lots of digressions and thoughts, but uh, a side by side of the same or as similar as I can get bases with that are superwash and not superwash are something I did a lot more of in the past. And these days I'm more likely to use Wool of the Andes and Stroll because I have a ton of each of those bases, but I should order or check to see if I have some Wool of the Andes Superwash somewhere in my <laughs> massive collection of undyed yarn. Uh, there's a lot of undyed yarn in this house. But actually, if you would like to learn more about the Wool of the Andes base or other Knit Picks yarn bases, I do have affiliate links to the yarn I use in each of my videos down in the video description so that way you can go learn more about the particular yarn that I used during that dyeing process. The only time I don't link to the actual yarn base that I used in my video, and I do this whether or not it's an affiliate link or not, I always try to link to it, but Knit Picks links are affiliate links, so I do earn commission there. Uh, the only time I don't link is if the yarn base I'm using is discontinued or no longer available. But I do try to provide a lot of helpful information, uh, the items and tools that I'm using in my videos, and also uh, further down in the descriptions where I have the like video contents, I try to keep track of the amount of acid that I use, sometimes the amount of dyes, certainly the dye brands and dye colors to make it as easy as possible for someone to attempt to recreate my results as you are exploring. So if you want more information about the dyeing process and maybe something I didn't mention in a video, it's always worth checking out the video description. You know, it's funny. I definitely dye a lot more superwash yarn in my videos then I dye non-superwash yarn. And the reason why this is funny is because when it comes to knitting, I often don't care whether or not the yarn is superwash because I tend to hand wash my hand knits anyway. And so therefore it being superwash isn't like a huge concern when I am thinking about a project. But a big reason why I enjoy dyeing superwash yarn is that I am less concerned about felting or anything like that in the process. And with non-superwash yarn, you do need to be a little bit more careful. Now, Wool of the Andes, which absolutely felt beautifully, uh, it's the base that I use whenever I want to do a felting project. Uh, it is also, I call it a workhorse yarn. It holds up really, really well through the dyeing process. And so it's one that is, I think, fairly easy to not accidentally felt, but yeah, that was just another thought that popped into my head as I am filming this probably fairly long conclusion. 
but sometimes I have a lot of thoughts that I want to share. So please subscribe to the Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube channel to hear more of my thoughts <laughs> and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of the videos. I always post at least twice a week, plus we have frequent live streams every month and bonus videos. And so, yeah, you don't want to miss any of it. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and thank you so much for watching.